It is my great privilege to introduce our commencement speaker. Elizabeth Dole, who is the president of the American Red Cross, has recently returned from the war-torn Middle East and is playing a key role in one of the largest relief efforts since World War II. Prior to coming to the Red Cross, Mrs. Dole served six presidents in a span of 25 years. As you all know, she is a former secretary of the Department of Transportation and of the Department of Labor. As an example, as Labor Secretary, she guided a federal agency of nearly 19,000 employees and served as President Bush's chief advisor on labor and workforce issues, as well as a key economic policy advisor for him. A Gallup poll identified Mrs. Dole as one of the world's 10 most admired women. And another poll conducted by McCall's magazine named her the woman most likely to be the first female president of the United States. That must have caused interesting dinner table conversation for her. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the class of 1991, the Honorable Elizabeth Dole. Thank you. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, for that wonderful warm welcome, and thank you, President Volgamore, for those very kind words of introduction. What a privilege it is to share this day with the class of 1991, your families and friends. And I can assure you, I will treasure the membership in the Albion community you will soon bestow upon me. Both President Volgamore and I are also members of the Harvard community. And as a member of the Harvard Board of Overseers, one of my unofficial duties is to follow the progress of our alumni. And Mr. President, I'll be happy to report back at the June meeting that you're doing just fine, thank you. <laughs> it's said that you can tell the quality of a college or university by the quality of the graduates. And one need only look at Albion alumnus William Ferguson to know that this is a truly outstanding college. President of 9X and Chairman of the Albion Board of Trustees, Bill is respected for both his business acumen and his leadership in higher education. And when I announced the Red Cross Gulf Crisis fundraising campaign, 9X was one of the first and most generous corporate contributors. Bill, thank you for your commitment to Albion and your devotion to assisting our servicemen and women and the innocent victims of war and how privileged I will be to receive an honorary degree with another outstanding corporate leader, Bill Lamothe. Bill is my good friend for whom I have great admiration, and Bob Dole says he's also one of Kansas' best friends. We just hope Kellogg keeps buying Kansas wheat. <laughs> like 9X, Kellogg was another early and important contributor to the Red Cross Gulf Crisis campaign. Heartfelt thanks, Bill. I feel a great kinship today with those about to graduate, for I too have sat in cap and gown hoping my commencement speaker would remember the three B's. Be brief, be sincere, be seated. <laughs> my remarks this morning will indeed be brief, for this is a day for celebration and not for speeches. And besides, I know you all want to have plenty of time for one last trip to Cascarelli's. As I look at this graduating class, I can't help but think back to my first day at Harvard Law School. There were 550 members of the class of 1965, and only 24 were women. A male student came up to me and asked what I was doing there. In what can only be described as tones of moral outrage, he said, don't you realize that there are men who would give their right arm to be in this law school? Men who would use their legal education? That's how I was greeted to Harvard Law School, and that man is now a senior partner in one of Washington's most prestigious law firms. And ever so often, I share this little story around town. I get great joy at doing that. <laughs> You'd be amazed at the number of my male classmates who call me to say, Please tell me I'm not the one. Tell me I didn't say that, Elizabeth. And you know something? I'm going to let them worry about it for a while. I'm just going to let them worry about it. Today, over 40% of the Harvard Law School class are women. The number of women professionals, lawyers and doctors, for instance, has almost doubled since 1972. And the number of women in managerial positions has almost tripled. 
and next September, a 20-year-old woman will command her 4,300 classmates at the United States Naval Academy. There's no doubt that the world you enter today is dramatically different from the one I entered 25 years ago. Doors once locked are now open to women and minorities, although we've clearly not reached the millennium. Ever more complex technology requires an increasingly skilled and literate workforce. Abroad, the Iron Curtain has crumbled as courageous men and women seize their own destiny and communism is exposed as the fraud it always was. Change, a constant in our world, is also a participant in today's commencement exercise. For amidst the pomp and ceremony, the recollection of past achievements and the anticipation of future loan payments is the undeniable fact that today signals not the end, but the beginning of a lifelong commitment. And in this age of marvelous machines and almost daily miracles, it is to your individuality, and especially to your individual conscience, that I appeal this morning. My career has allowed me, through several different assignments, to play a role in issues which have changed and shaped our times. As Secretary of Transportation, I oversaw America's material resources, our highways, airports, and railroads, and the technology that made them safer. As Labor Secretary, my portfolio was America's human resources, the working men and women who drive our remarkable economic engine and who must have the skills demanded by our increased technology if we are to achieve the quality workforce necessary to compete in today's complex global market. And now, as president of the world's largest humanitarian organization, my focus is on America's inner resources, on the voice inside us called conscience, a voice that calls us to our better nature, that motivates us to help those in dire human need, that tells us there are causes greater than ourselves. I'm reminded of a famous story about Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes, who once found himself on a train, but he couldn't locate his ticket. And while the conductor watched smiling, the 88-year-old justice searched through all his pockets without success. The conductor, recognizing the famous jurist, said, Justice Holmes, don't you worry. You don't need your ticket. You'll probably find it when you get off the train, and I'm sure the Pennsylvania Railroad will trust you to mail it back later. The justice looked up at the conductor with some irritation, and he said, my dear man, the problem is not where is my ticket. The problem is, where am I going? <laughs> Where am I going? What will I do? Will I be a success? These are questions that many of you may be asking yourselves today. And this morning I want to add one more question to that list. How should success be measured? How should it be defined? We live in an age where appearance is often more important than substance, or in the immortal words of comedian Billy Crystal, where looking good is more important than feeling good. For example, in Washington, D.C. and elsewhere, success is all too often defined by the power you hold, the names in your Rolodex, or the view from your office window. And it's not that big a jump to the sad fact that many of our youth equate the new car and expensive clothes of a drug dealer with success. Class of 1991, I'm sure I'm not telling you anything new when I say that life is much more than the sum total of possessions. For material possessions will rust away, wear away, or depreciate. But inner resources, character, must never depreciate. In seeking success, you must also seek fulfillment. Ask yourself not only what you want to be, but who you want to be. When we're 80 or 90 years old and looking back on our lives, don't you think we'll be asking questions like, what did I stand for? Did I make a difference, a positive difference? Whether on the floor of Congress or in the boardrooms of corporate America or in the corridors of a big city hospital, there is no body of professional expertise and no anthology of case studies which can supplant the force of character. And so it is not enough merely to seek individual success. To justify this day and ennoble all the efforts which precede it, you must continue the educational process all your life through. Above all, in seeking to be useful to others, you will continue to develop in character as well as knowledge. 
As I was preparing to begin my duties as president of the American Red Cross, my mother reminded me that she had once served as a Red Cross volunteer during World War II. And she said, Elizabeth, nothing I ever did made me feel so important. Soon to be graduates, I urge you to search until you find that which infuses you with a sense of mission, with a passion for your work. Search until you find something that leads you to say, nothing I ever did made me feel so important. Some of you may discover that feeling in the workplace as a lawyer, a doctor, a scientist, or a captain of commerce. Others may find it as a volunteer for the American Red Cross or another worthy cause. Still others may find it as a parent, a housewife, or yes, even a house husband. I invite each of you to make your own contribution in your own individualistic way to the land and its people. I especially hope at some point in your career you will consider the life of public service. For while you may not get rich, you will enrich the lives of millions of your countrymen. Your rewards may not be material, but rather the satisfaction of service, of making a difference, a positive difference in people's lives. Here at Albion, you have learned that so long as books remain open, then minds can never be closed. You have been prepared for a world hungry for talent and eager to reward skills and hard work. Many of you will go on to shape the events of your time. All the better then to realize that you cannot make good public policy without first having a set of private principles. Recently, I happened to come across a speech on citizenship and democracy, which I gave in 1978 when I was a member of the Federal Trade Commission. In that speech, I expressed my concern that many Americans seem to have lost the sense of pride and values that once prevailed among our people. I spoke of a decline in national confidence and the rise of public apathy in its place. As our citizens turned inward, we were in danger of turning out the lights in America. I stand before you 13 years later to report what you already know. All that has changed. The lights are burning brighter. Citizens all across America have regained confidence in themselves and in the mission of our country to serve as the last best hope of man on earth. Today we are witnessing nothing less than an American renaissance. We are renewing the ancient ideals of hard work, pride in family, love of freedom, and yes, trust in God. We have rediscovered our roots, and we are reaching for the stars. And I believe the most critical challenge facing the class of 1991 is that of ensuring that our American renewal is not simply a temporary fad destined for the cover stories of Time and Newsweek and then banished to the dustbins of history. No, these values are timeless, and so should be our devotion to them. In the words of Ted Koppel, there is harmony and inner peace to be found in following a moral compass that points in the same direction, regardless of fashion or trend. In the final analysis, it is your moral compass, your character, that counts for more than any bank balance, any bloodline, any resume, and yes, any diploma. And it counts most of all when shared with others. Woodrow Wilson once said, we should not only use all the brains we have, but all that we can borrow. Today, America applies for a very special loan, borrowing not only the brains assembled here, but the character that guides them. To be sure, as a nation, we require all the breakthroughs of which modern science is capable. We need inventive thinkers to guide our economy, protect our environment, secure our rights, and establish our place in the world. But most of all, most of all, we need individuals, committed men and women, for whom conscience is the North Star by which they guide their steps and those of the nation they love. This college is special because it has indeed answered the call of higher yearning as well as higher learning. How inspiring it is that you have taken the lead among the nation's small colleges in promoting student service. Each year, one half of this student body participates in a service activity like interning in juvenile treatment centers or the Big Brother Big Sister program. Your Albion Civic Life Project is a national model for matching student volunteers with community groups in need of help. And I'm proud to note that Albion is also home to one of the best American Red Cross blood donor programs in the state. Through these activities, you have shown your commitment to making a difference 
in the lives of others. And indeed, to those whom much has been given, much is expected. These past months, America has watched with pride as courageous servicemen and women risked their lives in a desert far away for the cause of freedom. But this morning, I'm looking at America's first and ultimate line of defense. For the source of all our national strength lies in the inner strength, in the conscience that forms our attitudes, shapes our ambitions, and turns our aspirations into achievements. And my wish for you today is that when you return to Albion many years hence, perhaps to attend the graduation of a grandchild, you can look back on your life and say, I used my God-given talents to tackle the tough issues, to help others, to stand for what is right. I fought the good fight. I remained true to my character. And I reached and stretched to the very limits of my being. And you know what? Nothing I ever did made me feel so important. Thank you, and God bless you all. Thank you.